So a warm welcome to the lovely Ariana Huffington. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And it's a pure pleasure. I can say it on behalf of the audience, on behalf of M Nordic Business Forum, myself. It really is a pleasure and an honor to have you here and to also hear your wisdom and insights that you just spoke about on stage. And now I have the privilege to interview you. And like I mentioned to you earlier, I'm an avid fan of both Huffington Post and, and also of yourself and, and your books, especially Thrive. Thank you so much. So, um, just a brief introduction, I'm sure it's not needed, but of course you're the media, media mogul and chair and president and editor-in-chief of Huffington Post that you founded in 2005 and the massive success of Huffington Post. Um, you've also been named twice on Times uh, 100 list of the world's most influential leaders. And of course, like we mentioned, you've written 14 books, one of them being Thrive. So with that introduction, I'd just like to ask, in, in Thrive, you, th you talk about the third metric. Even though it's apparent to me, why is it so, so important that this is implemented and endorsed and adapted with business leaders and entrepreneurs? Well, it really starts with our definition of success mm. because we've defined success in a very narrow way, just as simply money and power. And these are the first two metrics. Mm. But what I'm arguing in Thrive is that we need a third metric of success. Mm -hmm. And that includes our well-being, because we see a lot of people sacrificing their well-being by working around the clock. Our wisdom, mm -hmm. which is really our decision-making, and uh, business leaders are, after all, paid for their judgment, not their stamina. And I think when we are operating on empty, you know, and burned out and exhausted, we're not going to make the best decisions. And um, the wonder, you know, being able to appreciate uh, all the small beauties and ordinary pleasures of life and giving. So for me, these four pillars um, make up the third metric. And the third metric is essential for a full life, whether it's personal or in the business context. I can't agree more. And, and it's also both when reading a book and when you say it now, it's so logical in yes. a sense and yet we sort of thrive away from what is logical and what is very human in us. So what changes or norms do you find are needed to be endorsed in companies in order to really implement the third metric in sort of a day-to-day -day, um, business? Well, what is exciting now is that we're living through a real period of transition. Mm. And uh, we have a lot of companies uh, all around the world mm. that are recognizing the need to um, reduce stress in the workplace. They see the impact of stress on um, healthcare and on healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. So even if they're only interested in the bottom line, um, they see the impact that stress has on, um, on the health of their employees. Mm -hmm. And um, in, uh, in, in many instances, there are also opportunities to measure the impact of um, stress reduction practices mm -hmm. so that we can see directly the uh, reduction in healthcare costs and the increase in productivity. Because I know that you've endorsed this on Huffington Post and you have sleeping areas and, and, and I'm sure additional facilities, but on a real day-to-day -day basis, because we all want to do our best and we're all sort of striving to do our best, but implementing that with having yes. the third metric. How easy is that proven to well, be? Well, I think it starts with um, our relationship to technology. Mm. I think that's been one of the hardest um, things that has happened. You know, technology is incredibly liberating. I'm obviously incredibly grateful to all these advances that have made the Huffington Post possible. But it's also very enslaving mm. because we, we never leave the office. The office follows us everywhere. So we need to establish our own boundaries. And one of the things I talk about in Thrive and in my new book, which is entirely on sleep, because there is a sleep deprivation epidemic around the world, is that we need to assign a time, uh, at least 30 minutes before we're going to turn off the lights, when we turn off all our devices and gently escort them out of the bedroom so that we can have our own uninterrupted time to recharge. Mm -hmm. 
And speaking of sleep uh, deprivation, I know citing the quote, sleeping your way to, your, to the top, that you cited in Thrive, what has the, um, your knowledge and your experience of sleep deprivation and how to actually overcome that meant to you? Well, what is absolutely amazing now is that there, there is incredible uh, new science mm -hmm. on um, the importance of sleep. You know, for, for many decades since the Industrial Revolution, we treated sleep like a period of inactivity. But in fact, it's a period of incredible activity in the brain when really the toxic waste that accumulate during the day are cleaned out. And now they have found connections between um, not cleaning out those proteins because of sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. as well as connection between sleep deprivation, just about every disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, heart disease. So we are obviously um, in tremendous need to reevaluate this very, very neglected part of our lives. Mm. And I'm thinking so the transition from the old fashioned way of working, the whole money and power is success. And do, do you find it in, in your position, d does this resonate easy, as easily with women, female leaders, as with male? Because it's very male, the whole yeah. sort of cathartic of working and 18 hours a day. and. Well, I think, yes, there's definitely a macho element mm. around bragging about how little sleep um, they get. But it is changing dramatically because also we now see how athletes have embraced it. Mm. And, uh, sure. and I think that makes a difference. And also we, see we have so much data and so much science that it is much, much harder to dismiss. And with your expertise and experience with the media landscape, what do you... What currently in the state of the media landscape now excites you? Um, the fact that we are living in an amazing age of engagement, mm -hmm. um, that it's no longer top-down. Uh, our readers, our viewers, our consumers are now very engaged in sharing what is produced, in adding to it through their own blogs and comments, etc. So that for me is the most exciting aspect of new media. And, and on a personal note, what is the greatest lesson or insight that you've learned during your career? So I have a, I have a favorite quote by Rumi, you know, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. poet, who said, live life as though everything is rigged in your favor. Oh, I love that. And I love that yeah. because in every life, however mm -hmm. blessed it may look from the outside, there are obstacles, there are mm -hmm. challenges, and life only makes sense sometimes when we look back on it. Mm -hmm. So when we are able to keep that in mind, when bad things happen, it's much easier to, to take it all into account. And speaking of, of bad things, how do you handle f failure now compared to maybe before your awakening that, that you've spoken about when you, know, you collapsed of exhaustion? You know, I've been very lucky to have had a mother mm -hmm. who always made me comfortable with failure. Ever since I was a little girl, her feeling was Go for your dreams, try anything you want. You're going to fail along the way, but it doesn't matter because I won't love you any less. So her saying was, failure is not the opposite of success, it's a stepping stone to success. Mm -hmm. So true, so true. And from success leadership, what are the three qualities or two that make a great leader or business leader? And within great, of course, endorsing the sort of third element kind of leader. Well, obviously fearlessness, because that's how you can take risks and if it doesn't work, mm -hmm. um, you move on. Uh, empathy, because that's the way you build teams. And, um, and I would say um, the last thing is um, just real passion for what you're doing and, um, and the ability to truly enjoy it, even when times are tough, because in every leadership journey, in every business journey, there are challenges and obstacles. Of course. And then back to Huffington Post, what's next in line for Huffington Post and what's next in line for you? So the Huffington Post you know, is growing very fast. We're now in 15 countries. We just launched in Australia. <clears throat> We're going to be launching in China and Mexico next. And we're constantly innovating, mobile first, social first. So it's an exciting journey. When are you coming to the Nordics? 
We have to. Ah, we have you to have talk to. about that. Yes, we definitely yes. have to talk about that. And next in line for you? So I have a new book coming out, as I said, mm-hmm. called The Sleep Revolution. It's coming out in April. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm really excited to continue combining running the Huffington Post and my own writing and speaking and being a mom of two daughters. daughters. Ariana, thank you so much for taking the time. It really is a pure pleasure pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And keep on showering us with enlightenment and knowledge and and wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you.